Who Framed Roger Rabbit may actually be one of the best movies ever made. With its fantastic characters, animation, story, and countless references to classic animation, it's truly a movie that could have only been made in its day. Back when Disney was still kind of in a bad spot and Warner Bros. didn't care as much about their classic cartoon characters. It's very likely if the film had pitched any later or earlier, it wouldn't have been possible to get made. Still, it was the most expensive, yet most successful animated film when it was released, and has been hailed as an all-time classic. However, despite that, a sequel has never happened. Oh, there have certainly been many attempts to get one made. In fact, a sequel entitled Roger Rabbit 2 The Toon Platoon already had a full script made, one that I've heard was actually pretty great. Another one, who discovered Roger Rabbit, also had some stuff done for it, such as a few songs. But, both like, kind of made fun of Nazis, and Spielberg kind of just directed Schindler's List, and he was sort of like, uh, no thank you please. There have been other attempts as well, such as a full CGI animation test, pitches from various animators, a proposed buddy comedy starring Mickey and Roger made by Gary K. Wolf, the writer of the original Roger Rabbit novel, and apparently a new fantastic script has been made for one. But, Disney isn't interested anymore it seems. Zemeckis has said this is because Disney isn't interested in Roger anymore, and especially not Jessica. Gee, I wonder why. Roger Rabbit was huge in his day, but isn't really used or remembered as much anymore. Mainly with Roger having to be shared by both Disney and Spielberg's company, Emblem Entertainment, coming together to not only get a sequel greenlit, but also get the rights to various characters they'd want to use would probably be hell in this day and age. These companies back then were in a much different place than they are now. However, Roger received a lot of media back when the film was new and popular. Toys, games, dolls, all that jazz. Interestingly enough, it led to more stories being made based on the universe. In fact, Gary K. Wolf ended up making two sequel novels to his own Roger Rabbit book, recounting the original novel as just a bad dream, with the sequel novels resembling the film more, although to my knowledge, they're set in their own universe. However, the film actually did get a direct sequel. Kind of. You see, Marvel Comics had gotten the rights to Roger Rabbit to make a comic book adaptation of the film. Cute. Marvel also got the rights to produce a graphic novel sequel to the film. Even cooler. And then later on, there was a full-blown comic book series continuing the adventures of Roger and Company. And a spin-off of that! Whoa, really? That's cool. Comic book sequels have a somewhat eh reputation, and most people don't view them highly or just kinda ignore them. That or people just don't care and losers like me look into this stuff for some bizarre reason. However, while fluctuating in quality, Roger Rabbit's sequel comics are... kind of good. Like a lot of great sequel comics which most are unfamiliar with or simply just don't care about, it actually does quite a good job at capturing the characters and world of the film and expands on both the world and characters in many unexpected ways. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's start by briefly covering the comic adaptation of the film. As with most comic book adaptations, it is heavily condensed compared to the film. However, it does get the basic story of the film across. The whole story is shoved into 44 pages, which certainly meant some stuff would have to be cut. However, it also had some deleted scenes and new additions not present in the film. It's somewhat notable for containing the deleted pig head scene which was cut from the movie. It explains why after going to the bathroom, Eddie was only wearing a shirt and no pants when Jessica showed up at his office. He went to check Jessica's dressing room, where he was kidnapped by Doom, taken to Toontown, came out with the pig head, and then took a shower to get it off. In the film, they deleted it and just added a flush to make it seem like Eddie was going to the bathroom. Eddie and Roger also hauled off from the bar to some steep slope for Roger to be dipped, rather than at the bar itself. The theater they went to is practically empty, compared to the film where it was mostly full. Lena Hyena is nowhere to be seen in this comic. And all those awesome cartoon characters and references to the golden age of animation? And all the awesome appearances in Toontown? Almost all gone. And mostly replaced with just a bunch of generic cartoony looking characters for the most part, unfortunately. Also, the weasels die in the dip instead of them literally laughing themselves to death. Maroon also isn't dead, but in the hospital. Awesome, that is great, cool. And most importantly, Roger gives Jessica the nickname Jesse, which is wholesome as fuck. Many things from this graphic novel would later be retconned to be more like the film in the later comic books. Although a few new additions and changes in this comic adaptation would be mentioned in later comic books. But one thing that never really changed was the art style and how they distinguished the humans from the tunes. It being 2D art and all could kinda make separating the human tunes like Jessica from someone like Eddie a bit difficult. The comic gets around this by drawing the humans much more realistically and detailed, and most importantly, giving them a lot of shading. While the teens have mainly less shading for the most part, it works well. I never really had trouble distinguishing a human from a human-like tune. Although the shading differences in the comic adaptation aren't nearly as well done as they're done in later comic books. One thing that is kind of sucky about this comic, and kind of a lot of Roger Rabbit comics in general, is the lack of notable classic cartoon characters. 
All of the cool cameos are basically cut out and replaced with generic cartoony looking characters. The only real classic cartoon character mentioned is Dumbo, and even then, he's only mentioned and seen as a shadow. Damn! There are some exceptions later on, and they did find ways to work around this, but we'll get to that later. But yeah, no really cool cameos here or in the sequel graphic novel. Oh yeah, the sequel graphic novel. After the film and graphic novel adaptation both became a huge success, writer Bob Foster pitched a graphic novel sequel and was given the go-ahead to do so. This, to my knowledge, would be the final Roger Rabbit comic done by Marvel Comics. So yeah, The Resurrection of Doom. It acts as a sequel to the Roger Rabbit film and comic adaptation. It's a weird little oddity, that's for sure. So, does this comic book sequel measure up to the film in any way? Eh. It starts with Roger and Jessica at a movie theater, with Roger bawling his eyes out at the end of Frankenstein, with Jessica comforting him. I love how wholesome these two are, by the way. Such an oddball couple, yet they couldn't be happier than anyone else. It's too cute! It's, it's disgusting! In any case, Jessica points to a newsreel going on, talking about Judge Doom. Surprisingly, we're actually given the full history and origin of the Rabbit Framer himself. Judge Doom was originally a tune named Baron Von Rotten. Baron got his start in a small animation studio in 1921. I, I understood that reference. And black and white cartoons. In 1923, he moved to Hollywood and joined the Toon Actors Guild, where his career really took off playing many villains over the years and became known as the Toon of a Thousand Faces. An obvious reference to Mel Blanc, the man of a thousand voices. And he played many memorable villains such as Sawmill Operator, Minotaur, Abominable Snowman, Quasimodo, and in the propaganda cartoons, he played the role of the most evil man in history. The anime! But yeah, during filming on one of his shorts, an exploding grenade kind of left him unconscious for two weeks, which was rather unfortunate. I mean, personally, I would not like to be exploded. Not, not saying everyone would, but I personally would not. When he awoke, many people said his personality was very different, and he was very rarely seen out of makeup or out of character. Very few knew what he truly looked like, with the worst thing about his accident being his now red glowing eyes, which he always tried to hide. At his manor, among many old memorabilia, they found his top secret makeup and plastic surgery lab along with an old multiplane camera allegedly stolen in 1940. As we know, Eddie defeated Doom, who perished in the dip. Eddie is also seen holding up a model sheet of Doom, which I'm sure won't be important later on. So, after looking to Bob Foster's blog, I found some interesting things that were changed here. Originally, Von Rotten was going to be seen as having portrayed many actual real cartoon characters. This included peg Pete, Pete, the Big Bad Wolf, the Magic Mirror, Stromboli, Chernabog, which he won Best Actor for in 1941, by the way, and the Queen of Hearts. But due to rights issues, that all had to be changed to just generic cartoon characters. While he says the silly new characters were funnier, I feel it would have felt more Roger Rabbity if he had played actual real cartoon characters. Mentions of Disney in his studio were also left out, which really sucks. We later learned why this was the case in the back of the Roger Rabbit comic book series that followed this graphic novel. Since both Disney and Emblem Entertainment both co-owned Roger, any material made with the character would have to be co-owned by both of them. And as we know, Disney likes to control their properties because they're greedy and money hungry. I mean because they totally care about their properties and... QUALITY. And they didn't really want to have Disney characters play a major role in a comic book they couldn't fully own. A real shame honestly, it would have helped it feel more like a true sequel to Who Framed Roger Rabbit that way. Not to mention, Doom shopping as the Queen of Hearts is quite funny, and it's a real shame it isn't in the final product. Anyway, back to the comic. While Roger continues to complain about him not appearing in the newsreel, another weasel catches that newsreel, before heading back to his two other weasel friends, saying he found a way to bring Doom back. They go dumpster diving at Maroon Studios and find a model sheet of Doom. They then go to Arl's House of Ink and Paint, a reference to Arl Thompson's Ink and Paint service, to color the cell. They then finally go to Baron's mansion and use the multiplane camera to resurrect Doom in a homage to Frankenstein. It's alive! It's alive! As Doom's memories return, he becomes incredibly furious, stating he wants revenge on Roger. Wait, I thought Eddie killed him. Why is he focusing so much on Roger? The Weasels also mention how their brothers perished in the dip with Doom. And the Weasels from the film dying in the dip rather than literally laughing themselves to death is only continuity error with the film. As mentioned, the comic version indeed had all the weasels perish in the dip. And instead of killing Roger, Doom plans to ruin his reputation, making it to where he cannot be funny or perform at all, making it a fate worse than death, to a point where he'll want to die. That's some big brain thinking there, my toony friend. We then see Eddie once again, saying how he's been doing a lot of jelly beans since he quit drinking. Uh, 
I guess that's progress. And he then explains how he got a letter from RK Maroon's twin brother, CB Maroon, who just so happens to have a will saying RK left him everything he owned. How convenient. And wait, RK died? I thought he survived in the last comic adaptation. Ah, it's probably just falling off in the movie and not the comic, which would make sense. But it states the weasels died in the dip, which only happened in the comic adaptation, meaning it should be following the comic adaptation and not the movie. Okay, so if it's directly following the comic adaptation, then there's a continued error regarding RK being alive. And if it's following the movie itself, there's a continued error regarding how the weasels died. How did this happen? Regardless of which it follows, there's a continued error. I'm so confused. Anyway, moving on from that, RK's old secretary Velma calls him and tells Eddie to come down at 3 o'clock to meet the new boss. He does just that, being introduced to CB Maru. He explains how he plans for the first few cartoons to be incredibly cheap, and asks Valley to search around to see if Roger's into anything... sketchy. I deserve to be alone. And he doesn't really like CB or the job, but with an offer of 500 bucks, he kinda needs the money. So he asks around, and as to be expected, Roger stayed consistently funny and wholesome, which he reports back to CB, getting his 500 bucks. Noise. Meanwhile, Roger's getting back to his and Jessica's cottage house. The first time we see the house of the two, with his walking groceries to meet his lovely wife and all of his talking furniture. Yep, this is Toontown, alright. We learn that Roger hasn't made a movie in a while, having to survive off unemployment checks. Roger truly is the most relatable cartoon character. He says he needs work and worries whether his fans even remember him. However, his wife assures him his fans will never forget. Which is both wholesome and true. Other than a few novels and failed pitches, Roger's literally done nothing in years, yet we still love this little rabbit boy. Anyway, he suddenly gets a call from Velma, saying that CB wants to talk to him at the studio about possible work. Hell yeah, employment! He goes, and Roger finds it odd that CB is literally cloning RK. But anyway, CB mentions how they're gonna do low-budget, stylized cartoons. Roger says he's only ever done fully animated, but agrees to take the job for money and his fans. He happily returns home and says his wife and him should celebrate. But first, he turns out the lights. And the lewdest act of a tune occurs. Hot. Steamy. So next morning, he gets up early and mutilates himself as practice, as one normally does. He then kisses his wife goodbye, the single sweet too happy about it, and he runs off. When he gets to the studio, he ends up finding CB Maroon, who tells him where to stand, giving him very specific directions on what to do in the short he's doing with Karate Cow. Whoa, stand back, Mickey Mouse. Got nothing on Karate Cow, the most bestest of cartoon characters. He's told he must stand, turn his head, and move his lips. Nothing else. And when it cuts to action, Roger is very simplified. Unfortunately, he can't stay like this and ends up getting cartoony again, much to CB's anger. He demands he only do what he was told since it's shot cheaper and on twos. Roger simply just says that isn't animation, but CB says it's animation of the future, and he has to do it whether he likes it or not. Yeah, if you can't tell, this is a reference to what happened to animation in the 1950s. Animation, especially by UPA, was simplified and made cheaper in almost every aspect. All that refinement, detail, gone, as it was just easier to do simpler shapes and movements. I'm gonna be honest and say I don't hate this type of animation, but I can definitely see why Roger is not a fan of it. The fact that Roger's drawn the UPA style is also just such an amazing sight gag. Roger tries to do this style of animation, but unfortunately he just can't stop himself from getting really animated, causing him to unfortunately get fired. CB then mentions how he'll just get that other rabbit, the one with the tiger for a buddy. After some looking around, I found out this is a little reference to Crusader Rabbit which was the first cartoon produced fully for TV. Little easter eggs and references like this probably make me like this comic a bit more than I should. But back to Roger getting fired. It gets worse. The newspaper The Toontown Tattler starts to slander him, painting him as a bad guy. It seems CB is trying to destroy Roger's career in classic animation entirely. Roger begs Eddie for his help, which he of course agrees to. Looking into the papers, he sees Maroon is laying off a ton of tunes and auctioning stuff off, with a 30-gallon drum of paint thinner going missing as well. Maroon then holds a press conference saying how he's going to sell off all of Maroon Studios' props, films, everything. He says this is due to the wacky and original cartoon characters being so energetic, squashy, and stretchy, therefore more expensive. Well, that sucks. However, what Eddie finds bizarre is he's only selling it all for a hundred bucks. And also, oddly enough, to a company called the Weasel Development Partnership. Bro, I suppose some fishy going on here. Well, he ends up going to the address, and after tricking the Weasel Guard to letting him in, he ends up going to the company president, Mr. Mood's office. Yet he finds CB Maroon in there instead, saying he owns it. Hmm, 
I wonder what all of this could mean. Yeah, so if you're as dumb as a brick and haven't guessed it, Doom is disguised as CB Maroon. His sole plan is to sell the company to one he owns, therefore making it his own. Which is odd, since he probably could just continue to impersonate CB Maroon and own it that way, but... Eh, I guess he just didn't think of that? Or he just wanted to own it completely? Was it really necessary? I don't know. Either way, his big plan was to basically destroy cartoons by simplifying them into the UPA style, firing them, and most importantly, destroying Roger's reputation so badly that I'll beg Doom to kill him. He says once he buys the studio, it will be the end for all of the tunes. He then locks Eddie up with the real CB Maroon and tells the weasels that after they bought the studio, they're instructed to kill Eddie. Meanwhile, Roger and Jessica are moving out of their house, after being unable to contact Eddie, and decide to go see Eddie one last time. Only to find his house destroyed. Jessica's able to find the address written on the notepad and they head off. After following a trail of jelly beans left by Eddie, they find Eddie in the real CB Maroon. Eddie also reveals he now has a squirt gun, if filled with dip. Using the squirt guns which were unable to be sold at the auction, and using the paint thinner which was previously mentioned as stolen and in the vault they were kept in. They then realize they still got time to stop the sale and head off in Benny. It's kind of odd how Benny rarely talks in this comic. I don't even think he talks once, to be honest. When they arrive, Doom disguised as CB Maroon has already sold off the studio. But Eddie says it's only valid if he's the real CB Maroon. So, he puts the gun up to his head. As you do when you want to threaten someone. Only for the weasels to gang up on him. Eddie fires it at one of the weasels, and they start to laugh. Believing it's nothing more than an average squirt gun. Squirting it on each other and Doom. Only for Eddie to reveal it was filled with dip. How do I break this to you? You're a moron! So yeah, they melt, and we get some great A nightmare fuel, as the weasels and Doom are flushed down into the sewers by Roger. The real CB Maroon is introduced, and thankfully says cartoons will go back into production, and that they're all needed there by 6am the next day. CB then tells Roger and Baby Herman a short he has in mind for them, Tummy Trouble, and the rest of the book is simply a comic adaptation of said short. And that was Roger Rabbit The Resurrection of Doom. And it was... Okay, I guess. Yeah, so clearly the comic wasn't really as good as the original Roger Rabbit. Like that even needs to be said. I feel the biggest problem, besides the lack of recognizable cartoon characters that weren't created for the film, is that it doesn't really feel as big as it could have been. Honestly, I think the plot is fine and makes sense as a follow-up to the film. Especially with the references to the UPA and the simplifying of animation in the 1950s. It's inspired by actual events that happened in history, which the first Roger Rabbit did as well. Construction plan of epic proportions. We are calling it a freeway. I don't feel like this was a comic made by people as a total cash grab. It's very clear when reading it that the people making it were fans of Roger Rabbit. And the countless references to animation history really shows they had the potential to make a really great Roger Rabbit sequel comic book. I just feel it could have been stronger in terms of story, as a lot of the time it can occasionally feel like a repeat of the first film. Just not anywhere near as strong. Especially since Benny doesn't talk, Dolores is absent completely, and Eddie doesn't develop at all. The most we get for development with Eddie is that he stopped drinking and is now eating jelly beans. Oh, never mind, great character development there. Seriously, the lack of character development for Eddie is bizarre. He doesn't develop or change over the story despite being the main character of the original film. Which sucks, especially since he only ever appears once more, as we'll soon see. Another aspect I'm mixed on is Doom. Just kind of in general. In the commentary track for Roger Rabbit, it's mentioned how one idea that was tossed around was Doom being the hunter who killed Bambi's mom. That was not in the final film, and this book goes in a different direction with him being a famous toon actor who went insane after an accident. It kind of adds some tragedy to his story and makes him a bit more interesting. Which is neat, but I don't think giving Doom a backstory was necessarily needed. And not to mention the backstory is kind of stupid. I mean, it says Doom gets injured, but... I thought Toons couldn't get hurt or killed by anything that wasn't the dip or laughing themselves to death. And he got injured from an explosion? What? I feel I would have liked his origin more if it played a bit more into the story. That or allowing him to keep his original roles as real famous Disney villains. But as is, I don't really think he needed to be here. And my next problem with Doom is, did he really even need to return? Now I'll admit, having him revive via actual animation equipment is kind of neat, and a cool addition to the lore. But I kind of felt it would have been best if there was a new villain this time around. I feel bringing him back was kind of odd, especially since his plan this time around, while still dark, 
honestly comes across as less threatening. And my final problem with Doom being in it, which is something I picked up while looking into the comic online, why does he want revenge on Roger mainly? Roger didn't kill Doom, Eddie was the one who killed him. Why is his revenge so focused on Roger when Eddie is the one who killed him in the first place? Like yeah, he wants revenge on Eddie, but he focuses his revenge so much on Roger. Does he think he's the one who killed him? Is Doom going senile? Still, the comic has its moments. The art is nice, and I really appreciate the nods to the UPA animation style and animation history. Jessica and Roger are still a very wholesome and cute couple, and in many ways, Roger and them still feel like the characters they were in the film. Except for Benny. I actually laughed a couple times in this comic, which I wasn't expecting to. It's not a perfect sequel by any stretch of the imagination, but it has its positives and I do like it. I just feel instead of one comic book, maybe a miniseries to flesh out all of the character development and story ideas would have been a better idea. However, this would not be the end of Roger's story in comic books. Following the resurrection of Doom came a full comic book series entitled Roger Rabbit, Peter Pan, I know, along with the spin-off entitled Roger Rabbit's Toontown. A bit after Resurrection of Doom, around 1990, Disney decided to make their own comic book company called Disney Comics. Once again, creative title. And, well, they decided Roger would be a good candidate for an ongoing comic. So, on June 1st, 1990, his first ongoing series started. About a year later, on August 1st, 1991, a spin-off entitled Roger Rabbit's Toontown followed. The dip gun from Resurrection of Doom appears on a few occasions, though not often. Still, it and CB Maroon being a part of it shows there's some continuity between this comic and Resurrection of Doom. Honestly, I didn't expect the ongoing Roger Rabbit comics to be that notable. Not much info on them is available online, so I kinda just assumed there wasn't much to talk about, and they'd only get a quick mention in this video. Boy, was I wrong. The main Roger Rabbit comic is genuinely fantastic in a lot of ways, and feels like a worthy continuation to the movie in many regards. The best way I can describe it is that while Resurrection of Doom sort of felt like a cheap direct-to-video Disney sequel, the comic book series feels like an animated series made by genuine fans of Roger Rabbit and classic animation. The comic isn't just a gag comic made on the cheap to sell to dumb little babies, but an actually really good attempt at expanding the universe of Roger Rabbit. The stories feel like they had actual thought put into them, and it feels like the people behind it really wanted to continue the story of Mr. and Mrs. Rabbit. So, let's start by going over the first issue. Roger once again comes to Eddie needing his help to solve a case involving the Ink and Paint Club for Duke Malloy, the owner of the establishment. And so, they head off- Oh wait, no, not that. Actually, Eddie sends Roger off to go see a new private eye called Rick Flint. Yeah, so one big change for this comic is, well, Eddie isn't really in it besides the first issue. The explanation given in-universe is that he's too busy with many different cases, and he also doesn't want to have another partner after the death of his brother. The real reason for this is quite simple. Money! They only paid for the likeness rights of Bob Hoskins for one issue and no more. Normally it is possible to work around likeness rights in comics. The amazing IDW Ghostbusters comics have done it for years by making the characters look a bit more like caricatures of the actors. However, Roger Rabbit couldn't do that, for pretty obvious reasons. You can't really make the humans look like caricatures or cartoony when they are supposed to look realistic in comparison to the literal cartoons. Throughout all of the comics, the tunes have always been very stylized while the humans have always been drawn realistically. So you can't really stylize him when he's supposed to look realistic. And changing the appearance while keeping him realistic would just kind of look wrong. Going back to IDW Ghostbusters, many of the less good earlier miniseries tried to be realistic while drawing the characters, but since they couldn't get the exact likeness rights, you kind of got a Milbury effect going on here. And it just looks plain wrong. And the reasoning why he says no in-universe? I've got quite a few issues with it, but I'll talk about that and Rick Flint later. Back to the comic, Rick and Roger solve everything. Rick is given an office at the Ink and Paint Club, and Roger ends up becoming his partner as something for him to do, other than Jessica, when he's not making movies. And despite Rick's initial refusal, half the pay for the office is kinda hard to pass up. And thus, the status quo for the comic is set. Each issue would feature a main story in the first half going over a detective-like story, along with a less serious, more cartoony story in the second half involving Roger's life. Later on, when the spin-off Roger Rabbit's Toontown basically became a full comic of the second half, the second story would instead be an adaptation of a non-existent Baby Herman and Roger Rabbit short. Which is neat. The setup for the comic is simple, but good. As I said before, it feels like a Roger Rabbit TV series. Sure, all stories are mostly self-contained mysteries, but each feels really solid, and most importantly, are pretty well written for the most part. The Roger Rabbit comic thankfully understands the potential of the world it's set in. Toontown was a place that appeared in one scene in the movie, and we didn't get a whole lot of history on it. Now that's fine, the movie didn't need to explore that kind of stuff because it didn't really add to the story of the film. However, when you get to an ongoing story based on the universe, it would basically be foolish not to dive a bit into it. And thankfully these writers got that, 
Roger Rabbit the comic is amazing when it comes to fleshing out the world of the tunes and the lore of it all. One of the best examples is the black and white tunes. Now we didn't get to see many black and white tunes in Roger Rabbit, other than of course Betty Boop. In the film, she says that she hasn't gotten much work since cartoons went to color. Work's been kinda slow since cartoons went to color. Yeah, that. And in the comic, that's expanded upon. In issue two, we end up finding out there's a whole section of Toontown dedicated to black and white tunes. It's revealed they are actually very bitter and not fans of color tunes, because, well, color cartoons took their jobs. Not only that, but some black and white tunes, such as Miss Gloria, get back alley color paint jobs just to even attempt to get film roles. Sad back alley jobs, might I add, are done by Doodles the Cat, a silent tune who is revealed to have a grudge against talking black and white tunes. Also as a nice touch, he exclusively talks in title cards. We don't get a whole lot of time to know Doodles, a common issue when it comes to the characters in this comic, but the mere concept is interesting. The comic goes more into black and white tunes in issue 10, where it turns out that some have gotten upset enough to literally bomb her in studios. This is because of a certain new invention that has started gaining traction. Huh? A brand new television? TV has started rerunning old black and white cartoons, while the original tune actors don't get a dime, causing many old tune actors to get upset. We learn that the culprits behind this were two black and white tunes who worked in radio. A nice nod to how many voice actors of the time got their start in radio, due to radio only requiring a voice. And black and white tunes work for cheap. One of them was a classic cartoon character named Kuki Coyote, and the other was his girlfriend, Bernie Beautiful, niece of a classic black and white tune named Victor Vulture. Victor is interesting, as once again he drives home how the tunes are not always like their on-screen personas. He was well known for his villainous roles, but in reality was an extremely sweet guy, and a dialogue coach after he retired. We get a sweet moment where it's revealed that not only did he teach Roger all that he knew, taking him under his wing, literally, but Roger basically viewed him as a father figure. Kinda feels Baby Hermanish, going over how different a character can be from their on-screen persona, though in the opposite extreme. A happy ending does occur as due to the demand of black and white tunes, they want to make new shorts for TV starring them. Still, TV becomes a somewhat recurring element in this comic, which I'll come back to. The black and white tunes are just one of the many ways the writers behind this comic took the amazing world of Roger Rabbit and expanded on it. There are a ton of examples of this. At the end of Roger Rabbit, it's shown that the weasels were literally able to laugh themselves to death. In issue 3, an actor named Churchy the Dog does just that. However, he ends up sticking around for a while. It's revealed that one can briefly put down their heart before they go to help others. He did this to warn people about the filming location, Mr. Longyear's Carnival, which was incredibly unstable and not very well taken care of, and caused him to die in the first place, which is upsetting. He apparently can pick up the harp at any time and ascend off, or he may just have to deal with some unfinished business first. Either way, it took an aspect from the film and expanded upon it. It's also really cool that the story all happens behind the scenes of filming the Roger Rabbit short, Roller Coaster Rabbit. The bull from said short also apparently has a brother who's quite mean-tempered and also wrecks Herman's china shop. That's rough, buddy. The wolves also have a union. Nothing really to add, I just thought it was kind of funny. Wolves are also revealed to chase after women constantly because it's in their nature. Fascinating. Speaking of wolves, we meet a character named Wolf, and he reveals toon partners many times do hate each other, but they never truly try to hurt one another, even if they can go overboard. Like his partner, Percy Pig, who attempted to frame Wolf for his own murder. Yikes. Roger's Cottage also has a mailbox named Mel, who's a pretty fun character in their own right. In another issue, it deals with a bit part character wanting more work, focusing on a genie who's working for the octopus, Seth Lapod. Funnily enough, he mentions how nobody cares about genies, and they're always bit parts, and never get a lot of attention. Wow, how time change. It's also revealed toons get toon babies from storks, and there's a lot of drama behind the scenes, as gray market operations, such as the Nightwing Infant Placement Company, attempt to sabotage good stork services like the Sunshine Stork Service, through using insider information to purposefully give people wrong babies, pretending to be the Sunshine Stork Service, then giving them corrected ones in order to make the gray market operation look better and also get them more money. It's also revealed that the Ink and Paint Club was originally owned by a well-known criminal from the early 20s. Not, not these 20s, like the, the old 20s, the 1920s, yeah, that one. The criminal was Al Capone, I'm sure no relation, who went into hiding after hearing a famous toon lawman named Elliot Ness would be coming after him. Just, just lots of lore here. There are just a lot of cool and fascinating ideas in this comic. Interestingly enough, it also explains some of the differences between Toontown and the humans, showing that in many cases, their laws are vastly different. Issue 6's main story is almost completely dedicated to this. The character Stretch the Limo attempts to carnap all the Toon cars to get a chance in Hollywood, saying he wasn't let in because they wanted someone more like Benny. But it's revealed it's truly because of differing laws. In Toontown, if you were to say, park in someone's house, you'd only get a parking ticket. Yeah, not so much in the human world. And considering he has so many parking tickets, 
it's no wonder why they chose Benny over him. We also learn about tomb planes as well through Benny's cousin, Lenny. Initially, planes are pretty miserable as they're not allowed to fly without a pilot, and most are terrified of them due to being toons. So they're stuck grounded and don't get many jobs since the Army Air Corps training films stopped being made. The story actually shows that the comic does have some continuity to it, as Lenny appeared in a less serious backup story in issue 8, yet was followed up on in issue 16, when it was legalized for tomb planes to fly again without a pilot. However, this was quickly amended to say that they could fly anywhere except for human territory. Yeah. It's no secret at this point that the film in reality was kind of a metaphor for racism. And this comic doesn't shy away from that. I already mentioned the stuff regarding the black and white tombs, but the comic goes further than that. The comic mentions how humans are still somewhat uncomfortable with the idea of tunes, especially apparent in issue 15's main story. A detective named Nigel Sherford had taken a lot of Rick's business, and seemed to be doing well, but needed Rick's help after the police didn't believe him about a crime. Why? Because he ain't no human, he toon. What a twist! Nigel was originally Naughty Nigel the Silly Squirrel, a cartoon character who people eventually got tired of. But after seeing the Sherlock Holmes film starring Basil Rothbone, he was inspired to become a detective. Only problem is, again, humans don't really trust Toons. Even Rick goes on a whole tangent about how Toons always overreact and even goes on to say that Nigel was a fraud and cheater for posing as a human. Yeah, Nigel's kinda beyond pissed, stating that all of his clients were aware of the fact that he was a Toon. Not only that, but he calls Rick hypocritical, stating that if he used his talents and strengths on the case, it'd be fine. But suddenly, it's not okay when a Toon does it. This continues to show how the world of Roger Rabbit isn't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a flawed place and not perfect. Even at the end of the issue, when Nigel is able to solve the case and prove it to the police, he outs himself as a tune and states Rick will probably get a lot of his business back. Rick warmed up to Nigel and even gave him a sign for his agency with Roger's help. But it's clear that Nigel still won't be nearly as successful as he once was. Because, well, he was a tune. It really makes me wish we got more of him. Which almost happened, but didn't do the reasons I'll get into later. Man, a lot of things are coming later. Death is also coming later for all of us. The differences between the Toon and human worlds are ideas that pop up quite a few times in the comic. The comic isn't against bringing these ideas to the forefront. These stories are quite impressive and really help flesh out the world of Roger Rabbit. The comic is also helped by the fact that more often than not, it gets the characters from the film spot on in these comics. Roger's still the same lovable character that we all know and love. He's silly, wacky, and has a good heart and is very likable. In fact, in this comic, surprisingly, it's revealed he's not thought of highly by humans or tunes outside of his respective fans. Despite this, he still is incredibly positive, always willing to help out any tune or human that needs their help. Heck, there's even an issue where the roles are reversed, and Roger has to prove Rick's innocence after he gets framed, and does so surprisingly well. And of course, he's always there to help and support his wife when she's in trouble. Speaking of which, Jessica's also amazingly portrayed in this comic. Like the movie, she's very loving and caring towards her husband, as is he to her. He's also portrayed as just simply a really sweet woman. It's revealed she's even best friends with Lena Hyena, you know, the butterface guy from the film, and even goes to help her when she gets a cold. She's also incredibly snarky and has some pretty badass moments. She knocks out a gangster using a baseball bat she pulled out of her- Honga longa no no lo ganga. She also at one point acts like a simple scared woman, causing a criminal to let his guard down, as Rick grabs him while Jessica picks up his gun. Clever girl. And when her and Roger get caught up in a gray market stork operation, Jessica literally runs a forklift into a building, causing it to collapse on the villains. Jessica also finds out about an evil carnapping plot by pretending to be Baby Herman's mom and wearing, oh wow, those glasses, hair, just, damn. She also wears quite a few different outfits throughout the comic, which I cataloged for scientific reasons. Along with the <coughs> one, she also wears an exercise leotard, nice, nice. Uh, she channels her inner Shantae in a belly dance looking outfit. There's a cheerleader look. Oh my god, those legs! She wears jean shorts, which rivals Roger's cartoons in terms of the best type of shorts. Hair curlers in a green robe, beauty queen regalia, and dresses up as an usherette in a dream of Roger where she's in the future and fat. Yeah! Uh, so yeah, after looking over my scientific research, I can definitely say with some certainty that Jessica Rabbit's attractiveness has definitely carried over from the film. But again, there's certainly more to her in this comic than just her attractiveness. She is just so good. She's a complete badass and a really loving wife too. And that's not even mentioning the countless times she's been able to outsmart certain villains, such as the crappy TV producer and the previously mentioned kidnapper. It shows she's not only badass, sweet, and hot, but also very smart as well, which is cool. And as stated before, her and Roger are just so wholesome. They're always there to support and love each other no matter what happens. It is adorable. I'd say the only thing I'm kind of meh on is that the other tunes find her attractive as well. 
That may sound odd, but one of the cool things about the film was that despite all of the humans finding Jessica attractive, the scenes really didn't. With how Betty referred to Jessica as the lucky one, it was sort of implied that Jessica wasn't seen as attractive by Toon standards. And when you think about it, that makes perfect sense because Toons are all about being funny. Jessica's not super funny. So, from a Toons perspective, Roger is seen as the more attractive one and Jessica just got lucky. The comic however just makes her attractive to Toons as well, which I feel was a big mistake. But that's basically my only complaint for her portrayal. The rest of it's pretty great. Baby Herman is revealed to be pretty rich, owning a china shop and a mansion with a butler named Jervis. He's also revealed to be pretty dedicated to his craft, even going to a real nursery school after people start calling him the weakest parts of the shorts. He's even shown to be a pretty decent friend to Roger, helping him on a few occasions and even going to lunch with him. Having said that, Herman still literally has a woman who basically acts as his servant for free, just because she needs help getting into the cartoon business. Yeah, despite having some positive qualities, Herman still is quite the- Weasels also occasionally appear as villains, sometimes even teaching others how to be evil. However, the Weasels being the bad guys is occasionally subverted, such as in issue 1 of the comic, where Roger's neighbor is a weasel and betrayed as a pretty nice guy who just wants peace and quiet, and sadly does not get it. Benny also gets his fair share of stories. He's always there to help out Roger. As mentioned before, Benny also has a few family members this time around. His initially very upset playing cousin Lenny, as stated before, who Benny gets Roger to help. Benny also has a little cousin named Scooter who helps Jessica. It's pretty swell. Benny is also allowed to curse. Uh, censored. But he's still allowed to curse. It's pretty swell. Benny's the focus of a couple stories and even gets his own story in the Roger Rabbit's Toontown comic. In fact, I'd argue the Toontown series, despite being light on the mystery and lore building stuff, is probably the best the comic gets in terms of the actual portrayals of the characters. It also led to the creation of Winnie Weasel. She's basically just cut but a furry. So really, is there anything bad about this comic? Okay, so let's talk about Rick Flint. He was Eddie's replacement, and he sure is a character. Look, while I don't hate Rick, it's painfully clear they used him just because they couldn't get the rights to use Eddie. Rick has some original traits. He's an ex-Marine and ex-police officer, which, you know, he does use on occasion to get more information on a case. But honestly, he just is a lot less likable. He clearly isn't too fond on tunes, making judgments on them because they're tunes. And basically stated in the last issue that he's thought about splitting from Roger. And I get it, that's the point. He's a no-nonsense series detective and he's forced to work with a tune most of the time. He isn't exactly like Eddie. But reading the comic just makes me wish Eddie was there instead. Eddie was the main character of the film. The whole film was about him and his arc. More adventures between him and Roger were probably what most people wanted to see with this comic. And I'ma be honest, the excuse that Eddie can't have another partner because he's sad about his brother's death really hurts Eddie's character. One of the biggest developments of the film was that he was supposed to have gotten over that. To see him regress like this? It sucks. It really sucks. As stated, most articles on the Roger Rabbit comics strictly go over Resurrection of Doom and ignore all of the main comics, saying it's different due to Eddie not being in them. And honestly, I don't blame them. The lack of Eddie is probably the comic's biggest flaw. That being said, that's basically all I have to really see negatively about this comic. Sure, there are some small issues, some jokes don't land, and sometimes I feel certain stories are a bit too cruel on Roger, but most of it's pretty solid. The humor, as I've mentioned, is quite funny a lot of the time. There's a talking bomb opposed to violence, saying Bertha, no I'm not, yes I am gag. Jessica uses a net to catch Roger, which apparently was kept from the first time they met, which he used on her. I'm very curious about the history there. A tune is literally packing heat. All of the food is listed as either being black or white in the black and white section of Toontown. There's a lot of good humor here. And the humor is just one great quality on top of the many other great qualities I've already mentioned. It's clear that the people behind this comic cared about making it. And I'm not just saying that based on the stories I've read, but the literal writer's bible, which they released in the back of Toontown issue 3 and 4. I can't read all of it, but I am going to read this one little section of it, which I feel is really important. Write bright, don't write down to your readers. Yes, a lot of our readers are kids, and obviously there are some adult topics that you can simply never handle. But within the permissible topics, be sharp and even sophisticated if it suits your story. Don't worry that a gag might go over a kid's head. Kids are pretty quick. I love this. The people behind this comic made sure not to talk down to the readers, even though they were kids. They made sure the stories were good and smart, something that you could enjoy even into adulthood. This is a mindset I feel all children's media should have. What's even more interesting while reading the back of these comics is hearing some of the restrictions placed upon them. They couldn't delve into Roger's origins, I'm guessing due to the planned prequel film at the time. All non-film elements were off-limits, and they couldn't use Mickey, Donald, Goofy, or other cartoon characters. Sorta. 
Goofy and Donald appear as cameos, and Mickey is mentioned once, but they were mostly left out due to the rights issues I mentioned earlier. But there were still classic cartoon characters that could be used. As long as no one owned the rights to them. And issue 2 of Toontown had one. The issue is pretty standard for the most part, except for the appearance of Gertie the Dinosaur. For those unaware, Gertie the Dinosaur is one of the first and most revolutionary cartoons ever made, all the way back in 1914 by Windsor McKay. And due to when Gertie was made, she was considered to be in the public domain, meaning no one owned the rights to her and anyone could use her as they wish. So the comic is able to get away with featuring her. And I'ma be honest, it was really refreshing seeing Roger interact with another classic tune, and not just an XP of one. The cover even references The Walking Bed from Little Nemo in Wonderland, also created by Windsor McKay, and the story is even dedicated to him. There is no need to do any of this. They could have simply written and doodled something out in an afternoon and sent it off. I have gotten paid, so who cares? But no, they really did their homework and tried with this comic. And it shows. It's a really fun and great read. And it's really a shame it ended so soon. Both Roger Rabbit and Roger Rabbit's Toontown ended near the end of 1991. The comics are not planned to end so soon, as there were a few previews for the following issues. Issue 19 of Roger Rabbit was going to follow Roger getting chased throughout the parts of Toontown not seen before, while issue 6 of Roger Rabbit's Toontown was going to feature the return of Nigel Sherriford. It would have been really cool to see more Nigel and the new parts of Toontown. There's even plans for more stories based on characters like Bongo the Gorilla, the Bull from Roller Coaster Rabbit, Lenny the Plane, Melbox, and much more. But it was all cancelled. This occurred with a massive amount of cancellation of titles from DC Comics known as the Disney Implosion. Due to unreasonable expectations and low sales, every comic with the exception of Walt Disney's comic and stories, Uncle Scrooge, and Donald Duck Adventures were cancelled. It also seems there is a never completed Roger Rabbit graphic novel in production called I Hate Tunes. I have not seen any mentions of this graphic novel outside of the back of this comic. It's a shame it never came out, it could have been fun. Despite all the cancellations, and it most likely being unintended, issue 18 of Roger Rabbit surprisingly works as a conclusion for the story. In the comic at this point, it's been implied that TV was starting to take over, just like in real life. TV mostly was portrayed negatively in the comic, especially with the reruns of black and white tunes not giving royalties to the original actors, and a scummy TV producer appearing. However, with certain black and white tunes making new shorts on TV, it was implied that TV wasn't just a fad and something that would stick. So, in this issue, Roger has to decide whether to renew his contract with Maroon Studios or go with a TV producer. Roger then dreams about a future where he goes with a TV producer, and said TV producer runs off without producing any cartoons. Roger is then stuck as second banana on a public access television series where he's treated poorly. Jessica's also gotten chubby, the only positive, and has to work four jobs to pay the bills because her boss is incredibly scummy. This was due to rock and roll basically making her out of style, and in her performances, literal riots start due to her appearance because these people have no taste. Like, look, it's fine enough finding chubby gals attractive, but is it really worth throwing a riot over? Is it really riot material is what I'm asking here? These people are pathetic, I hate them. Rick is also down on his luck due to splitting up with Roger. Despite being happy about splitting up, he soon realized he was famous for working with Roger. Causing humans to not want to hire a Toon lover, and causing Toons to just go find Toon detectives instead. My guess being Nigel. Baby Herman also followed Roger's lead to TV, and got it even worse. He not only gets work in humiliating photo shoots and hates Roger's guts. And just to rub salt in the wound, Maroon sold all of his cartoon contracts to TV producers, and they all got successful, making Roger extremely regretful that he did not just stick with Maroon. It's revealed to just be a dream, and Roger runs off to renew his contract with Maroon after hearing that he could pay off detective work and stuff like that. While I doubt it was intentional, especially since the comic wasn't supposed to end here, it comes across that after signing, Maroon did end up selling his cartoon contracts at some point to TV producers that were reliable, which would mean Roger was able to successfully live on into the TV era, while everyone else probably had a much better future as well. It's an only good end to the comic, and Roger's story if I'm being honest, even if it probably wasn't intentional. Roger Rabbit comics wouldn't completely end here though. Many of these stories were later reprinted in the Disney Adventures magazine, and new stories were also produced as well. Disney Adventures is not really well preserved, though I have found a few original Roger Rabbit stories that were featured in it. And from what I've read, eh, it's okay I guess? One is a two page gag comic involving Roger trying not to crash a car. Well interestingly enough, another takes place after filming the football short scene in issue 15 of the main comic. It involves a villain named Professor Xerox, who makes a machine which duplicates tunes just as good as the originals. Who would also work for cheaper, who then prove they are not as good as the originals by melting to the ground. The comic then ends with CB thinking about the possibility of two Jessica Rabbits and I hate his face. 
Yeah, this comic doesn't feel anywhere near as good as the main stories. Main problem being that CB just feels overly greedy and creepy here. I mean, I get CB could be a jerk, but he seems especially greedy and creepy in this. With the art especially not helping. That being said, I've only tracked down like three original stories from the magazine, and the others may be of higher quality. I mean, I found another decent one. This one occurs during a Toon Union strike, where Roger briefly has to work as a mailman and go to Toontown Land. Where all of the extras live, who hilariously almost share the exact same names. This was slight variations. This story was actually pretty solid, so it's possible the magazine had some pretty great stories overall and just had one fluke. Again though, I only have three stories as reference, so take that with a grain of salt. The covers are all preserved though, meaning we do have this image of various Disney characters including Jessica dressed as Star Trek The Next Generation characters. And really, do you really need anything more in your life after seeing this cover? And around the May 1993 issue of Disney Adventures, Roger Rabbit stopped appearing in the magazine, both in terms of reprints and original stories. Thus, ending Roger Rabbit's comic book legacy. With Roger Rabbit, there's not a whole lot talked about regarding the characters besides the movie, and sometimes the shorts. There's no sequel to the film, and Disney stopped caring once they realized they had properties they didn't need to share with Amblem, leaving Roger kind of in the dust. Other than some cameos and theme park appearances, along with a few new novels by Gary K. Wolf, which did resemble the film much more than the original novel, there hasn't been much new Roger Rabbit since. However, the comics are quite interesting. Back in a time where Disney did want Roger to be big, producing new shorts, toys, and of course, comic books based on the character. And these comics are pretty great. They don't just do the bare minimum. They expand on the universe quite a bit. They get the character personalities pretty spot on. And despite some hiccups early on and near the end of the Roger Rabbit comics, it was very solid and, in my opinion, a great comic book. Even Gary K. Wolf, the original creator of Roger, wrote a letter saying how much he enjoyed it. The Roger Rabbit comics are super underrated and really deserve to be more well known. Disney only ever reprinted the story Who Framed Rick Flint in a paperback, along with a few stories being reprinted in Disney Adventures. I get why most of these comics have not been reprinted in trade paperbacks yet. Again, the rights to Roger Rabbit are complicated and it'd take Disney and Emblem agreeing somehow to get these comics any sort of reprint. But honestly, I think it'd be worth the legal troubles to do so. These comics have a lot going for them, despite some occasionally weaker stories or characters, and I think they deserve to be more well known than they are currently. If you can find any issues officially or a different way, check them out and give them a read. I'm positive you'll enjoy them. I know I did. And with that, I've been good old Groovy Jake, and thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed and want to see more content like this, make sure to hit subscribe and hit that bell icon. Until next time, stay swell.